Good afternoon. I'm Georgia Timoney, coordinator of the Integrating Special Populations Corps. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Crystal, the core lead and director of the Center for Health Services Research here at Rutgers University. We're very excited to uh, for Professor Conley to, to be joining us in the special populations series. And uh, uh, I, I think of uh, Professor Conley as really uh, Professor Bridge because he is, is, is bridging two different cultures of social science and genetics. And I often think that uh, uh, that also kind of makes him an applied anthropologist because these cultures are so different and navigating these cultures uh, I'm, I'm sure it's quite interesting, but it's, it's, it's extremely relevant to the efforts that NJ Axe is making to bring together people from multiple disciplines that are relevant to clinical and translational research and, and to, to truly bring together all the different uh, 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 disciplines and and expertise to, to achieve an integrative understanding of treatments and, 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 and outcomes. So, uh, uh, and, 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 and as we always like to say in, in health services research, the social determinants of health and taking that seriously. So uh, uh, Professor Conley is, the Henry Putnam University Professor in Sociology, faculty affiliate at the Office of Population Research and Center for Health and Wellbeing at Princeton, also research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, another subculture uh, that requires navigation. Uh, 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 economists and sociologists have, you know, longstanding tradition of uh, little digs at each other and uh, uh, ha has, has uh, been instrumental in helping to get off the ground the University of the People, uh, tuition-free accredited online college committed to expanding access to higher education. So um, Professor Conley's scholarship has primarily dealt with the in intergenerational transmission of socioeconomic and health status <clears throat> from parents to children very old core concern of sociology, but one that has now become more interesting <clears throat> because of uh, the, in, including the role of, of genetics as well as social structural factors in those processes. Uh, and when you add the complexity of events over the life course, uh, <clears throat> it's truly an extraordinary lens on how social structure and, and uh, individual uh, behaviors uh, fit together. So along those lines, um, uh, Professor Conley has looked at topics like the impact of parental wealth and explaining racial attainment gaps, the causal impact of birth weight on later health and economic and educational outcomes, um, and genetics as a driver of both social mobility and reproduction. Uh, trained in public policy with a PhD in sociology from Columbia and then a PhD in biology from NYU in 2014 and has written an extraordinary, of course, an extraordinary range of, uh, uh, shall we say, genres, uh, including textbooks, uh, personal accounts, uh, some and, and the genome factor, which is, is uh, a real, really wonderful synthesis of what uh, social genomics is, is uh, becoming. So uh, I could go on, but uh, uh, I don't wanna to take too much of the time. So it's my pleasure to turn the virtual mic over to Professor Dalton Conley. Thank you so much for that, um, that kind introduction, Steve. I'm gonna to try to share my screen now. Um, hopefully you're all seeing that now, my, my presentation. Um, 
So, yeah, um, I want to talk about um, how we can use genetics actually to inform social science questions that have long been vexing to behavioral scientists, not to be interested in genetic effects on social behavior per se, but really to use genetics as a tool to do classic social science. So hopefully what that means will be a little clearer by the end of this hour. Why am I not? There we go. Um, this is a propitious time to integrate genetics and social science, I would argue. This is the cost of genetic sequencing and, gen and genotyping. I, I don't have time to get into the difference between that, but basically genotyping gives you a bunch of data, sequencing reads the entire genome. Um, and starting uh, it over the last, well, really over the last 20 years, um, the, the uh, cost of genotyping or sequencing has been falling at a rate that's faster than Moore's law and microcomputing, if you're familiar with that that old saw or adage that every uh, 18 months, the cost uh, of computing drops by half. Um, so today, it really can cost about 30 bucks. We might be hitting a plateau at that point uh, to uh, genotype a member of your sample if you have a social scientific study. So it's really actually more cost effective to add a genotyping component to an existing social scientific study than it is to collect social science data. So in other words, uh, and as a result, a number of studies that um, many of you may have worked with before uh, now have genetic data on a genome-wide scale. So for example, the Wisconsin longitudinal study of, of the uh, Happy Days cohort from Wisconsin, 1957 uh, graduating class, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, the PSID is now genotyping, the list goes on, health and retirement study. Um, so, uh, and of course there are uh, other genetics studies that now also have social phenotypes that we can study. Um, I wanna argue that there are unique qualities of genetic data that make it an, an awesome tool for social scientists um, to solve problems of causal inference in the observational social sciences. First, genotype matters. No matter what uh, phenotype you pick from height uh, to blood pressure to things like the big five personality to educational achievement, there's some degree of heritability, meaning genetic variation in the population explains um, more or less, but some uh, of the variation in the outcome in the population. Um, in, in the words of the uh, Virginia um, uh, behavior geneticist, Eric Turkheimer, um, all uh, human outcomes are at least um, moderately heritable. Uh, <clears throat> so in other words, genetics matter. Um, genotype is stable from conception to death. Um, that helps us tease out causal relationships. So if I find that um, Steve and I are in the same um, pod and um, his genotype affects my behavior, we know that the, obviously it's going through his own behavior, but we know that uh, the causation is not going the other direction from my behavior to his genotype when we observe that correlation. That helps us solve some inference problems. And lastly, um, genotype is randomized conditional on your parents' genotype. If we know the genomes of both your parents, then you are a random draw. Um, each individual, each one of us is, uh, is a walking bundle, walking, talking bundle of about 10,000 little natural experiments. I call genetics the ultimate natural experiment in the social sciences. In these ways, it's distinct from other forms of big data that are, we hear a lot about um, in the computational social science revolution, Facebook, Twitter feeds, et cetera. They're, they're great for studying contagion, for social influence, for polarization, digital traces like Google searches um, as popularized by the book, Everybody Lies. Um, a tell can tell us the quote unquote truth, what people do or think when they're alone, or they think they're alone in their, uh, uh, on their laptop in their bedroom, Googling um, information. So for example, we can find out um, that actually um, Trump counties, Trump voting counties um, have more racist uh, Google searches than Biden voting counties, or that despite being one of the more conservative and religious states in the country, um, pornography consumption is actually highest in Utah. Um, 
What's distinct about these data is that they generally study effects, not causes. They're, in other words, they are just a way to measure outcomes that, that might be more efficient or might give us hidden information that we don't get from traditional 20th century style social surveys. But they're not, uh, they're not a cause of behavior. We can predict from these kind of data and sometimes in the, in the short term, there's big debates about whether or not the Google flu algorithm predicts the arrival of flu to a given community, um, what conditions we can trace on the web that predict macroeconomic conditions, whether suicide or not is predictable by search behavior and so forth. I wanna say that genetic data are even unique among biomarkers. Um, biomarkers such as DNA methylation, that is the attachment of CH3 groups to our DNA, telomere length, which is a measure of aging, C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation, even quote unquote low-tech biomarkers like blood pressure, BMI, height, et cetera. Um, you can see the rest of the list yourself. They are mediators or moderators. They go for, we go from the social environment to the uh, molecular measure, a biomarker measure, um, and to the outcome. They are not the origin of the causal chain. So they don't solve the causal inference problem. Very interesting um, data and results we can get from these data. So for example, just simply measuring the exhaled carbon monoxide of someone's breath tells you more accurately how much they smoke than asking them how much they smoke because obviously people tend to lie or self-delude that they smoke less than they do. So <clears throat> in fact, this is, I can't believe this is over 20 years old now. Um, uh, this is Francis Collin, who led the NIH effort of the Human Genome Project, and Craig Bentner, who led the competing private um, effort to sequence the human genome for the first time. Clinton wasn't really completed at this point, but I think Clinton wanted to get in a photo op before he left office. Um, so this is the announcement of uh, some progress on the, on the draft. The first full draft was completed in 2003. And after that, a lot of geneticists thought that it would only be a, few, a matter of a few years before the, the five genes behind heart disease, the dozen or so behind schizophrenia and the, and, the, and the score involved in say cognitive ability were discovered. And then we could get to work on sort of um, pharmaceutical, biomedical, et cetera, interventions to address those conditions. But um, there was a hard, uh, a hard uh, learned lesson that the uh, genetic architecture of almost all traits we care about, both things like height and diseases like blood, uh, like uh, hypercholesteremia, um, chronic conditions like diabetes, um, and, and of course, social and behavioral traits like educational attainment, big five personality, political views, they're highly polygenic, meaning the, uh, there, there's not five genes or even 20 genes or even 50 genes. These are influenced by small changes across the entire human genome. There's not a, a single region of the genome that's not implicated in, in all of these outcomes. In fact, um, the Stanford population geneticist, Jonathan Pritchard argues that uh, actually um, at most outcomes are omnigenic. The entire genome affects them because of the nature of the genetic network and biotrophy. Um, luckily, scientists soon realize that we can sum these minuscule effects across the human genome and come up with what's called variably the po a polygenic score or PGS, a new term that's coming out now that um, because score seems too judgy, is a polygenic index, um, polygenic risk scores, genomic risk scores, they're all these all terms for the same thing. I'm gonna call it today the polygenic score um, uh, because that's the most common uh, usage term in use today. Um, and it simply goes across a, um, uh, the genome and depending whether it's sequenced or genotyped, me measures uh, uh, variation at individual nucleotides. You, uh, you see the letters SNP, that stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, or pronounced SNP. And you see, but now I'm showing only one chromosome per individual here, but uh, male one has a T at this location. Let's say he has a TT, I mean, he has T on both chromosomes. Male two could be AT, 
and NEL3 could be AAA. And we basically go across the entire genome um, and measure the effect of those differences on a given outcome. So um, we would like to run them all in the same regression, but obviously that, that, um, that fails the rank condition, it's not identified. So we run um, uh, individual regressions with a bunch of controls um, like sex, age, um, birth year, et cetera, um, in their interactions and what's called principal components of the genetic data matrix to control for ancestry. And we try to get an individual effect from, from each SNP. So the SNPs are the Xs, the uh, XIJ, um, referencing the individual and the SNP. Uh, and we, um, from those regressions, in a very big discovery sample. Um, so for example, uh, this is the education a polygenic score calculation. Uh, we find that uh, SNP number RS1158470, we score um, A versus the alternative allele, let's say that's C in this case. And for each additional A, um, on average in our sample, um, there's that, that person has 1 12th fewer years of education, 0 0.08, negative 0 0.08. So if you have two A's, you would be negative 0.16 years of schooling. Um, we do that across, um, in this case, it was almost 1.5 million SNPs. It's very typical today to do 3 million SNPs. And we sum, for the, we, we sum for each person in a new sample what their, um, what their polygenic score is from these weights. So in other words, I now uh, can take these results from these regressions and, uh, and give a count of how many A's um, each person in my prediction or replication sample has at RS1158470 and score them. So if I have two A's, I get negative 0.164. We store that, we go to the next line, do it again for what, I, what, what my genotype is at the next row and, the, and so on for 1.5 million rows. And then we sum all those results. And then I get a single score that's normally distributed. In the case of education, this score is predictive. It has an R squared and the latest iteration about, about 0 0.14, 0 0.15 that exceeds the, the effective family income and many other standard sort of socio-demographic variables. You can see in here um, that in ad health, for example, in the blue bars, if you're in the top um, quintile, you have about a 60% chance of graduating with a four-year college degree. And if you're in the bottom quintile, you have about a 12% a chance of graduating with a four-year college degree. In other words, it's a, this obscures these kind of bar charts, obscure the messiness of the data that there are plenty of people in the top quintile that drop out of high school. And likewise, there's plenty of people in the bottom quintile who have PhDs. So, um, but if you're looking at population averages, it, it, it has a significant predictive power. So again, I'm not interested in just maximizing the, the R squared uh, that we can get from these, uh, from these SNPs and from polygenic scores. What I'm interested in is using that as a tool to understand the social world and, and vexing um, sociological questions that have been plaguing social scientists for, for decades, if not generations. And the first one I want to talk about um, is estimating peer effects. If sociologists, if there are no peer effects, sociologists might as well pack up and go home. If we, we're not affected by the people around us, then our whole field is, uh, it, it is probably not worth pursuing. Yet, at the same time, uh, estimating peer effects is one of the most difficult uh, things to do in observational social science because, number one, we have the problem of selection into groups. So I'm gonna look at smoking, hence these uh, photographs that all illustrate smoking. Um, we have the problem of homophily, that people, if Steve and I both smoke, um, did, did Steve influence me? Did I influence Steve? Or did we become friends because we were cutting class and met each other in the bathroom when we were um, cutting class and smoking cigarettes? or outside of school, after school, smoking cigarettes, did we become friends because of the behavior? That's homophily or selection into friendship or birds of a feather flock together. Then we have contextual effects. Maybe we both had a really 
um, stressful math teacher. And, and that drove us to need nicotine to calm down. And therefore, it's not actually Steve affecting me or me affecting Steve. It's the contextual effect that we share a math teacher. It's kind of an un, unobserved third variable bias. And even if we solve that, we have what's called the reflection problem that was pointed out by Charles Mansky, the Northwestern economist back in 1992, um, that how do I know whether Steve is affecting my behavior or I'm affecting Steve's behavior? Even if we measure um, that he was the first person to lit up a cigarette um, uh, and I was the second person, maybe I dared him, maybe some other aspects of my behavior influenced him. But it looks like um, if we just measure actual smoking, that he um, influenced me when really I was the sort of bad apple that was getting us both to smoke. So I'm gonna argue that genetics help us solve all of these problems here. I'm gonna use data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. Um, because of time, I won't go into the details. I'm happy to answer that any of that in, 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 in the Q&A. And the outcome um, and predictor of interest are during the last 30 days, on the days you smoked, how many cigarettes did you smoke each day? We also have a, 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 a binary of whether people smoke or not. The results are not really sensitive for that. And we have the smoking polygenic score. What is sort of the latest state of the art genetic prediction score, as, as I mentioned before, for smoking? Um, this is one of the few polygenic scores that actually work pretty well across different um, uh, social race group, race ethnic groups. Um, I can talk about that again in the Q and A if you like, um, but that allows us to ask some interesting questions that I'll get to. Um, just so you, to, to illustrate the, um, the genetic homophily, the birds of a feather flock together problem. Um, if we look at um, whether or not friends um, are genetically correlated across their entire genome, we see that friends in the top um, figure um, are about as related as second cousins. Um, once we net that out in terms of within school um, versus between school variants in genetics, um, we see it's about um, reduced to, to about 1.5% relatedness for about 0.3% related, relatedness. Um, when we look at specific genetic signatures like the education polygenic score, we see that friends are correlated at 0.11 in panel B. But once we net out segregation by schools, um, that is selection into schools, we see that um, it's about 0.6 and it's only marginally, sorry, 0.06 and it's only marginally significant. Interestingly, height, there's no correlation among adolescents in the US in their genetics of height. And interestingly, body mass index, um, uh, friends are as genetically correlated as they are in their education genetic signature. However, that's not explained at all by um, uh, variation across schools. It's entirely within school sorting. But the point here is just that um, friends are not a random group selected on a genetic level or on a phenotypic level. So we need to factor that out as we think about actual social genetic influences or, or peer effects. So what is our solution? Um, we have uh, we have, we combine two approaches. One is instead of focusing on friends, like who you say are your top five BFFs, we focus on the entire grade. And the notion is that if we have school and year fixed effects, then uh, it, you're in the 11th grade in, um, in uh, Princeton High School and I'm in the 10th grade in Princeton High School, the distribution of genetic risk in the 11th grade versus the 10th grade in the same high school is random. It's just the luck of the draw of who was in your grade that year, at least genetically speaking. Um, we have evidence to show that there that is indeed random, that the, there's, there's no trends, that the fluctuation in genetic risk among uh, the genotype peers in a grade is, is random, uh, conditional on what school you're in. Um, we treat that as the peer effect we want to estimate. Um, so that solves the um, that solves the, uh, the problem of homophily because people are not choosing which grade they're in. They're not choosing their grade mates, um, but doesn't solve the reflection problem. And that's where the genes come in. Uh, 
we use, uh, instead of actual smoking behavior as the independent variable, we use the metagenomic environment, as we call it. We use the, ge the genetic signature, the genetic risk for smoking, genetic propensity for smoking among your grade mates um, as, the, uh, as, as the way to identify peer effects. So um, that solves both the, cont the contextual bias problem, the, the, uh, the, the stressful math teacher problem, and the reflection problem of knowing who's affecting whom, because we know that the genes are not affected by, be, by someone else's behavior. What do we find? Um, we find that whether we use a reduced form uh, model or a two-stage least square, that there is a significant effect of smoking um, of your peer, or your genetics of smoking for your, of your peers on your, um, on your own smoking behavior. As a placebo as a negative control, we do height and we get a zero estimate. Um, there is a classic study on sort of the contagion of, of obesity um, uh, in the Framingham Heart Study that was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and that unfortunately conflated um, homophily with actual social contagion or peer effects. Um, uh, and my uh, erstwhile co-author, Jason Fletcher, uh, went ahead and reanalyzed the Framingham data and looked at height, headaches, and acne, all things we would not think are as transmissible across social networks through contagion, and found that they, were, they all displayed the same patterns as obesity, um, and therefore su uh, suggested that actually the findings in that very famous study were driven by homophily. Here we show that height um, is not having any, is not subject to peer effects. Um, to contextualize this, um, we show the point estimates on a number of other risk factors like age. Each additional year increases your probability of smoking by 10%. Um, being male increases your probability. Your own genetics increases your probability. Um, and you can see that if we, Imagine the the bot the 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 the, uh, the, po the mean polygenic score of your grade uh, has a large error bar. It's much more noisily estimated. But even if we take the far left of that error bar, um, it's about um, sixty percent as big as um, uh, uh, the effect of your own genes. So it's not a trivial. The meta metagenomic environment matters, and which I find super interesting. This is a challenge to both geneticists and social and behavioral scientists. For the genesis, we know that um, particularly with respect to the fact that we share our genes with our parents, some of what we're calling genetics in most models is actually what's called genetic nurture. It's the social influence of our parents that happen to share those genes with us and our siblings. Um, and it's a challenge to uh, sort of classic social scientists because uh, it suggests that a lot of what we are calling environment is actually our genetic, or is genetics one degree removed, the soup of genetics in which we're, we're moving through in life that's actually affecting us, the genetics of other people. Um, you can also ask other interesting questions here. So for example, um, we can split out peers' um, genetics by race, and we see we, for, for, um, uh, for non-whites, we don't really have a big enough um, estimate we, we don't have a, a big enough sample size, but so this is not really any sort of definitive thing, but just a sort of uh, conceptual idea. Um, you can see that the point estimate for white uh, egos um, is the biggest for white peers, and it's much smaller, even though they're overlapping confidence intervals, much smaller for non-white or all peers. Um, um, and non-white egos with, with um, all peers um, has a, has a similar um, effect size. So in other words, um, whites might be more sensitive to what other white adolescents are doing. Um, but again, this is underpowered, but I just think it's really interesting if we get more of a sample, the kind of questions you can, you can ask and answer, not about genetics, but about um, racial dynamics within a school. Um, lastly, in this study, we ask, um, is there a particular, Beyond the average, is there a particular um, aspects of the distribution that matter? For example, um, do a few very um, uh, a few individuals with exceptionally high genetic proclivities to smoke, what we'll call bad apples, um, kind of influence an entire grade disproportionately, 
or do shining lights, those who have very protective genotypes affect a, a, a whole grade disproportionately. We find that bad apples um, matter a lot. Um, they can, a few people who are sort of very hardwired to smoke can affect the behavior of an entire grade. Um, shining stars don't really affect uh, this kind of outcome. That if we look at a different outcome like GPA and studying behavior, it might be completely different. So um, that was work with Ramina Sotude. Uh, um, now I want to shift into work uh, that's joint with Asta Breitholt um, of the, the University of Southern Denmark and argue that genes allow us not only to look at peers, but to, to understand causal um, uh, dynamics of socialization within the black box of the family even. There's been an increasing literature um, uh, about how the gender of a firstborn offspring, which is conditional, is random in, um, in most Western societies where there's not antenatal sex selection, um, how the gender of our children affect us. And the idea is um, the traditional sort of Brothenbrenner model of child development thinks of the child at the center and then the then the caregiver and parents and the, the nuclear family and the extended family and community, um, all influencing the child. Um, and a more complicated view of the family uh, puts, puts that in dialect and knows that the child actually socializes the parents too. So um, uh, up till now, we've only been able to look at the effect of child gender, that being the only um, Kind of randomized experiment within the family. But at, with the properties of genetic data that I mentioned before, that conditional on the parent's genome, the child is a random draw, um, then we can uh, identify the effects of the child's quote unquote um, biological tendencies on the behavior of other people in the family. So to take an example, um, I see Tom Espenshade's name on the screen. If Tom and I have a child together somehow, um, and we're both at the 50th percentile for educational attainment and genetics. Um, we could end up with a kid at the 40th percentile by random chance, or we could end up with a kid at the 60th percentile by random chance. And um, how do we react differently to that, um, to that draw? Um, and how does that reaction vary by socioeconomic status? And that's a question that I've been interested in for over 20 years, having noticed that there seems to be increased sibling dis divergence um, and different parenting strategies in lower SES versus higher SES families. Specifically, um, back then I hypothesized that when there are limited resources, parents invest strategically such that the kid who has the best chance of making it, so to speak, um, gets the most resources and that generates sibling inequality. Whereas, um, high SES families that have a lot of resources to go around actually invest in, in the completely opposite way. They'll invest more in the child who's lagging behind in order to produce equality among the siblings. And I can only observe outcomes back then, but now we can actually look at how parents react differentially to, um, to their, their draws of their children. Um, so what do we do? So we look at and these are different samples. It's not important. I don't know. I can answer again in the Q and A what the differences are. But um, first, we we look at age six months. Does the child's polygenic score for education affect how parents parent at six months? And this is our placebo, really. We think that at six months, most kids in in the normal range of the distribution um, may be rolling over, might have started crawling. They hopefully are smiling and, and having a little bit of social reaction, but they're not really differentiating themselves that much. So any parenting behavior is probably more driven by the parents' uh, predispositions and not affected by the child's um, genetics. And that's what we find, there's just no effect. But then we go out to um, ages one to three years, and we find um, consistently across all these models, with one exception overlapping with uh, model six overlapping with uh, with zero, um, an effect of the poly kids' polygenic score. In other words, um, the a child with again going back to that example of the sixty percent draw versus the forty percent draw. Um, uh, if we get a kid at the sixtieth percentile, we're going to invest more in that kid in terms of, and this is measured by 
at this at this at these ages by reading um, time spent interacting with the kid and so forth um, up till age three even so even before age three we see that the child's quote unquote innate um, propensities are affecting and structuring social interaction in the family so when we think about about it um, we could think of of course it's likely that reading to a kid at bedtime um, enhances their verbal ability. Um, but part of that is driven by the, the, uh, the, the, the priors of the parents, but part of that is driven by what the child evokes. The one child in a family may say goodnight after one book and the other kid might keep begging for more and more books. And that's the environment, of course, that they get read to but they're evoking that environmental response based on their genome. So it's actually part of the genetic effect. But getting to the question of do parents from different social backgrounds invest differentially? The answer is yes. We find a significant difference no matter how we split cl social class. Um, uh, I was sort of half right 20 years ago. Um, parents who are more advantaged invest in all their kids equally, it seems, at least at this age. Um, uh, later on, we see actually more compensatory investment, as I hypothesized. Um, uh, but the the uh, lower SES parents, in this case, having no college degree, um, it, uh, actually are more elastic or responsive to their kids' characteristics. They invest in what the economists would call more efficiently. Um, uh, it, kids who have um, greater ability uh, get more investment. We can also ask how do siblings affect each other in a way that we couldn't identify before. So here, this is results from the Minnesota Twin Family Study, um, dizygotic twin sample. Um, and you see in the far left bars um, that my own polygenic score for education affects my educational outcome. That's uh, the blue bar. So for about every standard deviation um, uh, higher in the polygenic score, I have um, I, my actual educational outcome increases by about two thirds of standard deviation. But on average, my, sib my siblings, my twins, my co-twins um, uh, polygenic score increases by um, my own education. If we go to the, the, the right two sets of uh, bars, we see that um, for sisters, uh, sisters are what's driving this effect. Um, but brothers, there's no effect of my brothers, my twin brothers' um, uh, genetics on, on my outcome. This is very tentative results. It needs to be replicated. Other results um, uh, from other studies of non-twins don't show these strong effects. So they might be only for twins. But again, this is the kind of thing you can explore, gender dynamics within families, how sisters and brothers relate to each other and influence each other differentially because we have this natural experiment of the fact that conditional on parents' genotype um, offspring genotype or a random draw. And that's why I'm so excited about um, genetic data as a tool for social scientists to, to answer old questions, but also ask new ones. Um, I'll give you one more example, um, how we can use genetics to sort of move the bar on, on social causation. So there's been long, um, uh, it's been long known that in South Africa, in Brazil, in the United States, in, in multiracial um, societies such as those um, among um, those of African descent, there is a correlation between skin tone and hypertension, that is high blood pressure. Um, most likely um, explanation for that is colorism, that uh, individuals with um, darker skin experience more stress and discrimination, and that translates to higher blood pressure. But of course, it could be any number of things that are that are that that bias that estimate. So, for example, in the United States, African Americans in the South tend to have darker skin tone than African Americans in the North, and we know that people in the South, black, white, other, um, tend to have worse lifestyle um, uh, uh, behaviors, health behaviors with respect to blood pressure. The 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 swath of the South in Appalachia is called the stroke stroke belt for a reason, um, and that applies to all races. So for example, it could be just that um, region is confounding um, um, the, the, the association. Um, you know, and we can think of any number of things, we can keep adding variables, but what we do is a different strategy. We use sibling fixed effects. 
um, in uh, the uh, National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Adult Health. This is joint work with Tom Laidley, a former PhD student and others that's out in demography last year. And we, and we uh, show with, with, within siblings, um, even there is a, um, uh, a significant um, relationship between skin tone um, and hypertension. So the, 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 the sibling with lighter skin tone has less likely, uh, has, has less risk of hypertension. If we measure actual blood pressure, we see the same effect. Um, now it still could be the possibility um, that the genetics of skin tone also affect directly um, the cardiovascular system. So whatever genes control skin tone, and there's a number of them, um, could also somehow affect, say, the elasticity of our arteries. And therefore, um, even though I'm using family fixed effects and looking at the random draw of um, within a family of which brother or sister got um, lighter or darker skin, um, it could be that that is just a proxy for the genetics of skin tone and that, that gen those genetics of skin tone independently directly affect risk for hypertension. So we can't completely rule out the, um, the genetic explanation and in favor of a story of social bias yet. But now that we can measure genetics, we take um, the, the, uh, the SNPs involved in skin tone and, we, uh, and there's still variation among them in non-African American populations. And we look at in those populations, whether or not there is um, a relationship between these SNPs and um, blood pressure. It's kind of like a placebo test in, in a condition where there's, we're taking out the, um, the, uh, the discrimination pathway. Do we still see the uh, effects of, of, of the, 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 the biggest um, skin tone variants uh, on hypertension? And there's only one that's significantly different from zero, the first one, and that's in the opposite direction. So we do this placebo test. We find that there's no effects. So we uh, feel like we're on much firmer ground concluding that um, co the color skin tone um, hypertension relationship within African-American community is really driven by discrimination and bias leading to stress and, and then in turn to hypertension. So again, we're using genetics not to study genetics effects, but to, to, to really isolate social causes. Um, I don't think I have time to go into the gene environment interactions, but that's sort of, for many of us, the, um, the holy grail of, of doing all this, the idea that um, genetics might be the prism that ref refracts a um, white light of an average treatment effect into a rainbow of heterogene heterogeneous responses. Um, I'll give one quick example. Um, one of the great natural experiments I've used in my, um, in my career outside of the genetic stuff has been the Vietnam draft lottery, um, uh, randomly assigned um, to be draft eligible or in draft ineligible based on a drawing of birth dates. Um, and here we, use, we integrate that information, which is really a randomized controlled trial um, by accident and, um, and genetic information to show that, for example, um, only people who are at genetic risk are affected by being drafted in terms of their lifetime smoking behavior. So if you're um, at zero or below, you know, at the median or below the, the mean on um, your genetic risk for smoking, being drafted does not affect you, um, your smoking behavior. But if you're in the top half of the distribution, so for example, two standard deviations above the, the mean in smoking behavior, in smoking genetic risk, um, you, and you get drafted, that results um, in a, a pack a day more on average habit. So the military and war is a very tobacco genetic or tobacco philic environment. Being exposed to that um, produces differential outcomes based on people's genotype. So that's an example of G by E. There's other examples I won't get into. Um, last thing I'll say is that um, this polygenic score, as much as I'm excited about it as a tool for social scientists, is already left the lab, so to speak. Um, uh, the first uh, polygenic selected embryo um, was turned baby was born last year in 2020, um, and increasingly we're going to see the polygenic score being used by places like um, um, uh, insurance companies 
who want to risk adjust. Um, it's, it's forbidden for health insurance by the law of GINA, but it's not forbidden for life insurance, car insurance, long-term care insurance. We're going to see maybe even school admissions, especially for um, younger kids where the actual measurement of, of, of academic performance is, is got a lot of measurement error. Maybe they're going to start using um, polygenic scores. Um, sperm and ova banks um, could measure the, uh, the polygenic scores and a number of factors for uh, their donors. Um, and as I mentioned, um, very presciently predicted by the 1997 um, science fiction movie, Gattaca, um, we could imagine a, a world where um, reproduction is largely um, uh, based on genetically selected embryos using the polygenic scores. So this, um, this world is, this scary, possibly scary world is made all the more possible by uh, data that we collected, nationally represented data that shows a very high degree of um, tolerance for use of these polygenic scores in these domains. So if you look at across traits, um, people are, uh, are less comfortable with uh, using a polygenic score for skin tone or for height, they're in, the IQ is in the middle and disease traits like diabetes and schizophrenia are the most accepted. Um, across domains, um, we fix the trait as IQ. Um, we see that people, I had thought that my prior um, was that embryo selection would be the quote unquote creepiest utilization. It would have the lowest acceptability, but it, it, uh, in retrospect, it makes sense. People like uh, applications where um, they're in control where they're picking their sperm donor, they're dating, they're looking at dating sites, they wanna know their potential partners, polygenic scores, or they're selecting their children. Um, those are all acceptable, individual choice and control. Domains where um, it's another institution judging you based on your polygenic score, like a school or an insurance company, people are less, from, less comfortable with. So I'm gonna skip these la last slides. Um, and uh, leave time for discussion. So we have about 10 minutes left. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dalton. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, so much information and so much for all of us to think about. Uh, not the least of which is that I think if you're friends with Stephen Crystal, you'll wind up smoking is one of the takeaways, I think. Um, oh, definitely. <laughs> Uh, the, the last slide, when you were going over the life insurance and long-term care and how people feel about that uh, in terms of is it acceptable, is it, is it also ethical? I mean, is that sort of what you're driving at? Or? Um, you know, I, I guess I would say a simple um, answer to that would be, but, you know, Gina, the 2008 law signed by President Bush um, that forbids, it's called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, it, it pre pre prevents use of genetic information in health insurance decisions and in employment. Um, but a simple solution might be, let's just extend that law to include everything, essentially, like schooling, um, uh, but more importantly, like um, insurance markets, like car insurance, health insurance, uh, long-term care insurance, life insurance. But the problem with that solution is that uh, we, we now have a direct-to-consumer genetics market um, where millions and millions of Americans, almost one in 10 Americans now, has their own genetic information thanks to 23andMe, Ancestry.com, and other services. So if I find out that I have a high risk of dementia, um, early dementia, I'm going to quickly buy long-term care insurance um, and if only I have that information and the insurance companies can't risk adjust, you create adverse selection. And as economists know, that will lead to like a, a death spiral and a um, market failure in insurance. So I don't think, um, however we want to regulate this, it's, it's, it's not, so that's, uh, the answers aren't so obvious. So maybe the answer is actually um, provide everybody with their polygenic, either genetic, uh, the genotyping services, not make it so that only people who can afford $149 or $99 can get it and make everybody buy life insurance, make everybody buy long-term care insurance like we do 
with the Affordable Care Act in, in the health insurance domain. So I, I don't think the solutions are simple and, or necessarily obvious and in terms of ethics, that's above my pay grade. I mean, something I um, struggle with and think about a lot, but I don't have the answers. Thank you. You might just want to jump in anywhere on this general yeah. subject of uh, personalized medicine and genetic differences and treatment responses. Yeah, um, there's two different applications for personalized medicine. One is identifying risk um, for people. Um, so that's already happening when you look at the uh, very tail end of the, for example, polygenic risk score for cardiovascular disease, it seems to be nonlinear. So people at the like 90th percentile and above act, are at very elevated risk for heart, heart attack. Um, and that's been already, already being used in the UK, for example, to identify people that should be on statins from their 20s, for example, um, before they show any sign. And it seems to actually add information over and above a traditional family history. Um, so there is a you know, very good example. When you go to the more sort of messy social and behavioral outcomes, whether that's something about learning disability or, um, or substance use, um, where uh, our, our squares are so much lower. Um, well, actually, it's not that much lower for educational attainment, but for most other outcomes, it's, it's lower. And we're far away from um, having a, a, a risk score that would actually identify people at great risk for adverse outcomes um, as compared to like traditional family history or um, social behavioral variables. That's, and even farther away from the dream of where we can tailor an intervention based on genetics, which is, I think, a holy grail that people want to move towards. So for example, in the area of like, if we have a um, polygenic score for verbal ability, you, we would want to differentiate. Um, I mean, I, I know there's basically whole word instruction for, for reading has already been generally discredited and phonics kind of has won out um, in, on evidence. But imagine that some kids learn better um, from whole word and some kids learn better from phonics. We could detect that and then separate out the way we teach. That's one sort of idea. Um, likewise, you know, if we could um, identify people with, you know, high risk of substance abuse um, before puberty even um, and, and, and intervene in the critical years, maybe that would help. But we're, again, a, um, pretty far away from that. Um, uh, you know, you could imagine more draconian um, um, policies like I talked about the bad apples and smoking behavior. Um, do you want to segregate those people off and not have them not influence other people? And I don't think we're talking about that kind of like um, policy of separating people based on genetics, but um, those are all things that are going to be, someone's going to suggest that at some point um, as this science proceeds um, in the next few decades. So it, I think it's really important to have social and behavioral scientists and ethicists and, and others at the table as we think about this, because whether we like it or not, um, the, gen the genetics genie is out of the bottle and people are increasingly going to um, take their own data, calculate scores and put them to ill or good use in their own lives. So um, and, and that's for individuals, but also for program makers, entrepreneurs, policymakers, and so forth. So yeah, we're a long way away from that, but um, I think we should be prepared to how we, to, to, we should start thinking about how we want to think about it. If you uh, were to take a thought experiment, and I realize I might be veering a little bit more to the, the biomedical side of this, but suppose that uh, uh, RWJ Barnabas Health System offers everybody who's coming in as a new patient or all their existing patients uh, uh, will, 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 will do a genetic sequence for you and we'll put it into our chart. Uh, uh, is, is, is that a good idea? And how would, what would be some of the ways that we might want to use it? I mean, there's all sorts of, <laughs> they're talking about doing that for all babies born in New York City. I mean, right now it's not, 
close to happening, but um, but you got to be prepared for all the discoveries of non-paternity that are going to happen. Right. Um, you're going to be prepared for a lot of things. I personally, obviously, would not make that, you know, it, make make it voluntary, um, of course. Um, and uh, but even under that scenario, I'm generally for um, more information, right? But you have to be prepared. To, what if you discover the gene for Huntington's disease? That's a single gene, like highly penetrant, um, you know, 100% penetrant um, Mendelian disease. Are you going to tell people like, what kind of information you're going to share with the people themselves? All sorts of issues like that come up. Um, and again, I'm sorry to use the phrase again, but I think that's above my pay grade as a sort of um, behavioral scientist trying to figure out cause and effect in human. Well, unfortunately, you know, we want to, we all want to say that and we all want to be modest, but like, who are the folks with the, the, with the greater smartness and knowledge above us and do they really exist? So this is, I think, where, uh, you know, we might find ourselves on one of those panels of, 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 of experts with the, uh, uh, with the ethicists and so forth, who, who, uh, you know, you, we, we'd like to find the philosopher king to, to delegate these things to, but the philosopher king might not exist. So, uh, like Bob Dylan says, I guess it was up to me. Uh, collectively, you know, we have to, we, we, we might have to actually think about these things because that philosopher king to delegate it to might, might not be available. Uh, this is not a session for me to philosophize, but uh, uh, I, I, I couldn't resist that one. And we are uh, getting up to time, but but just one more, you know, one more invitation if anybody wants to, to unmute and just uh, uh, jump in before we close on this uh, really fantastic and interesting presentation. I'll just take one moment to... Uh, Hey, before we close, too, if we yeah. could, sorry, before we close, if we could also let people know that there is a poll afterwards. I know we're seeing it pop up in the chat how much everyone has really enjoyed your presentation, Dalton. So thank you so much. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you for being Thanks with Thanks for having me. Special populations. We, we really appreciate all your insight and expertise. Uh, thank Professor Conley for a, a fascinating uh, talk that will give us a lot to think about. Thank you.